Hello BookTube, and welcome to your Friday Mega Stuff video. I have a feeling this might be a bit of a big video, because there's a lot to go through. I actually had to make a list of things to make sure I didn't forget anything. Uh, and I want to I start by apologizing uh, for a couple of things that are beyond my control. One is the weird underwater Venetian light here. There's no sunlight today. Uh, and so I've been playing with my, uh, my light control, my highly sophisticated light control, which is the... the blanket on top of the air conditioning unit uh, and this is about the best that I can do. I also want to apologize for the uh, any audible background construction noise. The construction is continuing <laughs> unabated uh, directly outside my front door. It, it, it's been ranging all up and down the street but for a while it's been directly outside my front door so some of that might be audible. Uh, but anyway we're doing a Friday stuff video today for those of you who are new to the channel. That, that is a video in which I lump together all the little bits and pieces of stuff that probably couldn't stand a whole video on their own uh, into one video for your watching convenience <laughs> and of course we'll start with babies uh, because I put out a call for pictures of your Shakespeare for ShakeTube 2020 which is all month long in September uh, you're gonna get a barrage of ShakeTube videos this weekend uh, and a number of you sent me pictures of your Shakespeare and I mentioned that if you want to send me pictures of your But if you want to send me pictures of your dogs as well, you feel you could feel free to do that. And a number of you did, but a number of you also sent me pictures of your cats and rats. <laughs> so, so that that and that has just been a parade of babies on this channel. It's been tremendous fun. So I wanted to show you the latest ones, some of which are absolutely adorable. Look at that. That is Sally. Oh my! And look at that old Shakespeare. I think she's pretty much done with the whole idea of posing for a picture. And then look at this. I'm told that this dog, this little puppy, romped into someone's workplace. This is not the first workplace puppy that we have seen. I, and again, I repeat, how would you get any work done? How are you expected to do anything other than simply turn over the day to a little dog like this? I, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, and then this next picture, it's definitely the right collected Shakespeare. It's the, the, uh, the great Riverside collected Shakespeare. And I'm told by the sender that the animal in the picture is a mountain puppy. <laughs> Not 100% sure I believe that. It looks suspiciously like another kind of animal entirely. But look at that Shakespeare. Oh my. In perfect condition. I wonder how many of you out there have that brown uh, Shakespeare. That the, the brown Riverside Shakespeare. I believe it's the second edition of the Riverside Shakespeare. Then the third edition has a big close-up of a, an alleged portrait of Shakespeare, and it, it is a post-contextual, post-modernist nightmare on the inside with, I think, five King Lears, two Hamlets. So ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous stuff. When, as, if, as if we come to a giant congery of scholars in order to have them punt all scholarly questions. We don't come to them for that. We come them to them in order to have them make sense of scholarly questions. So you give us one Hamlet, and maybe you talk about textual variations or other additions. You give us one King Lear, and it's the result of your scholarship, your scholarly consensus. Rather, well, anyway, anyway. Uh, so, so uh, uh, the the mountain puppy looks a little skeptical, but that's a great volume to have. The only problem, of course, with it is that it's not it's not particularly convenient. <laughs> it's not convenient to read. I say that as a someone who is doing more and more reading on his e-readers. That big Riverside Shakespeare is not convenient. I, I'm not going to get rid of mine because it's loaded with notes and, and insertions. It's, a, it's a, a wider than normal hardcover with onion skin paper, so it's really good for insertions. Mine is full of, it's just a palimpsest of bits and pieces, bookmarks, receipts, photos, articles from a million different places across a, a broad variety of decades so I'm not going to get rid of it but it's the devil's own nuisance to pick it up and read I mean if I've, if I've got reading if I'm going to do reading on the couch it's it it has to be rested on a pillow on top of my lap it has to be it, it's not convenient to read certainly nothing is convenient to read uh, when compared with an ebook on an iPad <laughs> absolutely nothing is, is convenient other than that. But anyway, I'm glad I have the iPad because I've got a bunch of things here that I want. I want to make sure that I don't forget anything. Uh, like, for instance, number one, 
uh, my reaction to the Dune trailer <laughs> it generated an enormous reaction on its own. Lots of comments, but also lots and lots of emails. I leave my email on every video. You are welcome to email me about anything. And a number of you have emailed me about about my my reactions to that trailer. Uh, I'm very happy that the, the emails have, once again, as I've mentioned a few times here, the emails have exalted in the fact that in this little community, we are perfectly free to disagree with each other without risking civility, without risking the friendship that we have. I love that. Absolutely love it. So I had people email me and saying, I just saw your reaction to the Dune trailer. How can you, how can you badmouth Villeneuve, the director? He's a genius. You're nuts. And what about this? What about that? I think that's good. As long as the you're nuts is done in the kind, in a kind of arm over the shoulder friendship, then I am all for it. And, and, and a number of you are passionate fans of this director. But there was also a thread running through a lot of those emails. And that thread was, uh, even though I very much disagree with you about the Dune trailer, as, as far as I can tell, I'd say probably 70, 75% are running, disagreeing with me about Villeneuve and about the trailer, saying that they were excited when they watched it. That's great. That's fantastic. I, I, more power to you because more power to you is more power to me. If it, if it turns out that the movie ends up being really good, I'll be as happy as anybody. Uh, so, but a, a theme running throughout most of those emails was, could I talk about more trailers? <laughs> Why? I don't know, since my reactions to this trailer incensed a lot of you, but I guess some of you liked the way I talk about movies. I, I don't know one way or another, but I, the, my answer would be, the only reason that I talked about this trailer is because a, a huge number of you asked me to do that, wondered, emailed me, or left, left comments and said, what are your thoughts? Obviously, we're thinking of you, since you, you love Frank Herbert's Dune books. You have done a read-along of all but one of them. You've talked about previous Dune filmed adaptations. Surely, you have a lot of thoughts about this. And I did. I don't about every movie trailer, but if there's another one that strikes your fancy that you want to know what I think about, just let me know. Like, I could imagine if there were a new Superman movie, uh, or if there were a new Star Trek movie, I could understand, I could imagine then that a lot of you would want to know, if there's a trailer for it, what do I think? And that I would understand, you know? Or once there's a teaser trailer for, uh, is it Amazon that's doing a series set in the world of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings? Uh, set in the back history of, uh, in the second age of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings? When there's finally a teaser trailer for that, I imagine a lot of you will want to know what I think. If it's a case like that, just let me know. Uh, but I, I, I'm obviously not going to change this into a movie channel, right? Because I'm not a dude bro. Movie channels on YouTube, the biggest ones, the most passionate ones, are all hosted by black-haired young white men who love the Raimi Spider-Man movies and perhaps not uncoincidentally could easily be cast as Peter Parker. And I'm not, I'm not that. I think I'm a little too old even to be Uncle Ben. <laughs> so I might be Captain Stacy, but, 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 uh, uh, but one way or another, uh, when it comes to trailer reactions, <laughs> I don't want to turn this, this channel into a trailer reaction channel, but I'm happy to do more, uh, if you just point out what you want. <laughs> and then, uh, another thing that I wanted to mention here was Zoom. I've mentioned that I have recently cracked Zoom technology. I know now how to have a Zoom conversation. And... I mentioned, when I when I talked about that originally, I mentioned that a young friend was willing to do the editing for me. That he was willing to cut out the the stuff at the beginning of the chat and at the end of the chat and make a nice, edited, coherent video. And uh, that offer still stands, and I'm immensely grateful for it. But naturally, I wanted to take that burden away. I, naturally, I wanted to see if I could do this myself entirely. Not just the mastering of the technology and the recording, but also the... The editing, which I and I can't do that. I I've never had any patience with editing pro, uh, software of any kind, and not a lot of it has made any sense to me. I, I have I have I've lost count of how many times I have downloaded an editing software app or program, looked at it, and then said out loud to the screen, "I don't have a project. All I have is a video. Why are you asking for a project? Like I'm going to call in people from Morocco to do the craft service table. I don't have a project." I just have a video. <laughs> I know that's just a matter of rhetoric, but still. Uh, I think I have figured out a way to do that. I think, so far, it has worked five or six times. I think I figured out a way to get around the need to edit. 
and that is to get that that crosstalk how are you throat clearing falderall out of the way in a preliminary call that's just a minute long and then tell the person okay game face because <laughs> when i call you back that is going to be the interview and there you go and that has worked so uh, that has worked with authors and with youtubers so i'm pretty much going to go with that and uh i have to confess i love it and it has created a very great need and so i notice on the days when nobody zooms with me i notice those days i sit there wishing i had a zoom lined up for that day and it isn't always possible i don't know i i've been asking around about whether or not this is etiquette or or there's an element of psychology involved or a lot like for instance when we're talking about booktubers authors aren't having any trouble saying yes to this but w when it comes to booktubers uh are our booktuber are booktubers just waiting are they waiting for me to invite them rather than raise their hands themselves i don't know one way or another it's still very very early days but it's it's still late enough in the process so that i miss it when it doesn't happen i i voxered with steve partridge you may have noticed some of you may have noticed a resurgence one might even say a recrudescence <laughs> in steve partridge videos uh all of which with his adorable dog benji resolutely off camera uh and I was I was voxering with him, and I said, "Well, what about you? Wouldn't you want to, to Zoom chat with me?" And he said, "No, not really." And I said, "Well, why not?" And he said, "Well, mainly because you're fat." And I said, "Fat?" And he said, "Well, I mean, you're interesting to talk to, and I'm sure the conversation might might go okay. But you have to admit, you're a bit of a chunky monkey, or as Steve Partridge would put it, a chunky monkey." <laughs> and, and that was rather rather harsh. And I wonder if the rest of you are thinking that. One way or another, I will still I will still pursue Steve Partridge for a Zoom chat about, uh, well, I don't know. I imagine if we look really hard, we might be able to find something interesting in his life. <laughs> I don't know. Otherwise, we can make something up. But all sorts of other people, too. You're all out there. I want Zoom chats with all of you and with all of your favorite authors. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway... Uh, Another thing that I wanted to mention that I've got on the list here is that quite a few of you have asked me what I think about the, the announcement that Maggie O'Farrell's book, Hamnet, won the Women's Prize for Fiction for 2020. Uh, and I have some thoughts that are mostly predictable. I mean, it was this is, this is a very satisfying win for a couple of reasons. One is that she, it, there was a widespread idea that she was overlooked for the booker. Uh, and two, and maybe not incidentally, Hamnet is a fantastic book. It, it really is a fantastic book. It's a terrific novel. It, it, I'm not saying that, that that means it deserves to be nominated for any kind of award. I, I, I don't... I'm losing a lot of faith in awards. I'm, I'm rapidly just dismissing them all from my mind uh, for a number of different reasons, most, of, most involving either the fact that the award has disgraced itself in recent memory or that the award has announced that it now has an explicitly Twitter political ideology that doesn't have anything to do with the quality of the books. The uh, the Booker Prize for 2020, the Woker Prize, didn't actually explicitly announce that, but their long list makes it abundantly clear. Abundantly clear. The long list has, out of, out of 13 books, I think 12 of them are debut novels, and the debut novels are spread across a demographic and representational and intersectional spectrum that was the thing the Booker Prize was talking about. It was. It, it is very, very clear from the comments made by everyone connected with the Booker this year that the literary quality of the books involved was never even talked about. It was never even considered. That when groups got together at tables or rather through Zoom meetings, the thing that was talked about was, well, uh, who hasn't been represented lately? And that means that the award is meaningless. Uh, and I, I don't understand, since the Booker Prize people have... have in one way or another said that sort of thing i'm not i'm not sure why hillary mantel is still the odds on favor to win she certainly will not win the whole point of the of book of the booker prize 2020 will be to deny her a win why because of her skin color so i <laughs> i i don't know i and because she's not writing a debut novel because her, her book isn't it, the mirror and the light is not full full to the brim with debut novel mistakes gaffes uh overwriting like so much of the books on the list. Uh, and the 
that kind of consideration is sort of mollified by the fact that, that Hamnet won for the Women's Prize because it's a worthy book. It's a very worthy book. Uh, and it's, it, there was a sense that it had been snubbed. But on a broader scale, I, I dislike the Women's Prize for Fiction because it announces its discrimination right in its title. And I don't want that for any literary prize unless you're talking about a quality that the entrants have control over or that the publishing industry has control over. It, it, whether or not the, the writer is a woman or uh, or a minority of some kind or whatever is <laughs> if you do a novel for for instance uh, small press unpublished authors underrepresented authors in terms of whether or not they've had a publishing deal that I can understand that those factors are, are it's interesting to bring those to the attention of the reading public but a prize that says no men need apply I, I don't, I've never really had a lot of patience with that, and now my general store of patience with literary prizes just in general is so low that I look at the Women's Prize for Fiction and say, well, okay, what does this mean? I, I, know, I know the political answer, I know the Twitter answer will be, well, women have been underrepresented in literature for so long, they've been crushed under the iron heel of the patriarchy for so long, that it's completely right and just that they have an award of their own, and that is absolute malarkey. Not just in terms of historical accuracy, but also in terms of a very key understanding that zillennials and Twitter political people in the 21st century simply do not get. They were taught it by their parents, their parents were taught it by their grandparents, their grandparents were taught it by their great-grandparents, all the way back literally to the dawn of humanity. And that is that two wrongs don't make a right. You don't fix oppression by oppressing someone else. You don't fix underrepresentation by underrepresenting someone else. You don't fix gatekeeping by gatekeeping a different group of people. You are exulting in, a, in the power of the moment that allows you to do that, but I want to stress that it's the exaltation in that kind of power that is what got off the previous generation of people that you now hate. You're exalting in the same thing. You're getting off on the same high that they did. I now have the power to exclude you completely, so I'm going to do that. I think the Women's Prize should rebrand itself, keep the, keep the money, keep the judges, rebrand itself as just another literary prize, looking for literary excellence. And the fact that if it did that, the long list and the winner would still, odds on, almost certainly be a woman, speaks to the other ridiculous claim, which is that women have been underrepresented in the literary arts. <laughs> the the marketplace, the readership, the library patronage, the the money, <laughs> the best selling status. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so uh, those of you who are asking, I'm very happy that Hamnet was nominated uh, and that it won, and I strongly recommend Hamnet as a book for you to read. I just don't have a high opinion of the Women's Prize itself or of any other literary prize. Even, I'm waiting, 2020 will probably be the year that I also fall out of love with the National Book Critic Circle Prize. I'm, that, that It started last year. Last year's National Book Critic winners were mostly done for political reasons, for Twitter political reasons. I imagine that this year it will be entirely that, plus lecturing. Um, we saw that just recently the, the, with the, uh, the Academy Awards, with the, the, Academy, the Motion Picture Academy. Putting out a lecturing, a, a condescending, a moralizing list of quotas for all movies that will be considered for an Academy Award from now on. Just horrific. Just absolutely horrific. Uh, that uh, that the, the movie industry in Hollywood, which right now has a lower standing in the public esteem than it ever has because it looks like it's a gigantic nest of pedophiles sheltering other pedophiles. <laughs> it looks that way. I mean, it's not that way entirely, but it looks that way. The public has never had a, a lower opinion of what Hollywood is like. And for Hollywood at a time like this to come out and, pr and put itself forward as a moral teacher, <laughs> that we're, we, you're all bad people, those, those Academy of Motion Picture uh, guidelines say. That's the un they don't say it on the surface, but it's very clear by implication. You're all bad people morally. All of you directors, all of you crew members, everybody, all of you except us, you're all morally bad people. And these guidelines are designed really to help you to, to 
step up to our level of morality, to, to our level of morality that was hiding Harvey Weinstein forever and ever, and that's still hiding Brian Singer. <laughs> yeah, so that's a level of morality I really want to attain. <laughs> but anyway, that's the, uh, I don't know how we got on the, the, uh, the Academy when we're talking about the Women's Prize. Uh, but we also have uh, mail. I thought we'd go through some mail. Uh, I warned you this would be a little long. It might it might be a little long. Uh, first, we'll do a couple of magazines. I got a couple of magazines in the mail, and the first one of them really worried me. Uh, it's the new issue of Vanity Fair with Breonna Taylor on the cover. Look at that. Uh, those of you who might not be keeping up with the news, <laughs> I doubt I doubt that it's possible that you don't know who she was, but she was minding her own business in her home when the door was opened and her body was riddled with bullets for the crime of being black in, in private. Uh, and... Uh, this is a, an issue of Vanity Fair that is quote unquote guest edited by Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, who's an author a lot of you will have read on American race relations, and I think he's a fantastic writer. Uh, I, I love his work, but not so much him. He does occasionally flirt with it, but the, the people in in his literary orbit tend to just go for the very easy and racist. Uh, reduction of a lot of the stuff that he writes as all white people are bad or more insidiously that all white people are racist that it's uh, I've heard this from so many people on Twitter on booktube I've heard this from so many people that all white people are racist and that they drink it in they imbibe it on a genetic level from childhood so that when they get to be adults and they have thought about all of their predispositions, they've thought about all of their bigotries, they've thought about all of their of their biases one way or another, it doesn't matter because they can't help it. Because they can't help being racist. <laughs> and I, I, it's so obvious to point out that that is exactly the same reasoning, if you want to call it that. That's exactly the same kind of bigotry that was used against black people for the first 300 years they were in this country. That, sure, some of them might be fairly decent, but as far as the negative attributes of their entire race goes, they can't help it. It's baked in. There's no such thing as a good one. <laughs> I, I naturally reject racism in any of its forms, including its currently fashionable one, which is racism against white people. To say that all white people are inherently racist and cannot change that. That the most they can do with the virulent racism that makes up their DNA, the most they can do is shut their mouth and be lectured by an 18-year-old know-nothing person who happens to be black. That that's the most they can do is humbly lower their head and be screamed at by an 18-year-old who, who learned everything from Twitter. That is deeply, deeply racist. And Ta-Nehisi Coates has never been that kind of a writer for me. I know that some people have found that in his writings, but I never have. I've always been blown away by just the, the rhetorical power of it. But nevertheless, I thought, okay, if you're going to guest edit this issue of Vanity Fair and it's going to be all about the, the incredibly uh, explosive state of American race relations right now, then whether you have explicitly done that or not, this issue will do that from start to finish. I looked at it when I got it in the mail and thought, okay, well, then, you know, apart from anything else you can say about it, this is going to be a Vanity Fair issue that you cannot read. Because it's going to be a Vanity Fair issue that from beginning to end actively calls you a Klan member, a ra an active racist. I am not. And I don't need to apologize to 12 psychos on Twitter who, call, who say that I am because I can't help but be. <laughs> I have exa actually examined my, my, the things that I think and feel. Uh, and and I can hear right now, not probably anybody in this in in this audience, but I can hear right now. The reaction would be, you think you've examined it, but you aren't even able to do that. You aren't even able to examine it. You don't even have the tools. The tools themselves are flawed with racism. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember when those exact same things were said to black people. You may think you understand the higher arts, but you're actually not able to. You can simulate it to a degree, but what you really need to do is go back to community college and major in agriculture. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember when these kinds of, of sweepingly racist statements were said to other people. Now they're being said without any change in the vocabulary to a different skin color. That doesn't make it any better. Two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> but, uh, but I was wrong about this issue. It's actually fantastic. Just fantastic. Uh, and, and I want to... Uh, uh, to take you through just a couple of parts of it. I'll, I'll try to find them quickly. I was amazed 
by how good this was. I don't know. Usually, the reason I'm putting air quotes around is because usually when somebody guest edits a big thing like this, it means they show up in the office once, they toss off a few ideas, then they leave. They don't ever do any editing. Not, not in the trenches editing. But actually, ta Coates wrote quite a bit for this issue. And one of the things that he wrote was the opening, the, the editor's letter, uh, which is called The Pyromancer's Dream, in which he compares, he, which he draws an analogy between the sheer murderous rage of some white people in America towards black people, which he says in the course of this essay, doesn't make any sense unless you think there's some great fire they're putting out, some great alien they're trying to kill. It doesn't make any sense on a personal level that, that you would stalk someone on a suburban street and execute them. It doesn't make any sense on a personal level that you would kick down someone's door see them sitting there and shoot them multiple times. It doesn't make any sense. In this essay, he says it doesn't make any sense. It makes more sense if you ascribe some sort of weird, psychotic fear to that kind of violence. Uh, and at one point, he, uh, he tries to explain that. I want to read this bit to you. Uh, the logic here is obvious. To plunder a people of everything, you must plunder their humanity first. To despoil the peasantry of Europe, it was necessary to regard them as a class condemned to, quote, eat thistles and briars, and, quote, go naked on all fours. Only after the English told themselves they were warring against cannibals and drinkers of blood could they devastate the Irish. To massacre the children of the Cheyenne or the Arapaho would be a great crime, but to exterminate the nits who would grow into lice was wholly permissible. And so it is that the children of the enslaved, regarded to this very day as a great fire consuming white maidenhood, immolating morality, and otherwise reducing great civilizations to ashes, there is an insidious cost to this. A man invents a monster to justify his brutality, only to find the monster is within. For fear of fire, America has turned its worldly affairs over to a barbarian game show host, presently selling charlatanism while pandemics rage across the land. Uh, that, that, of course, was written on Deadline a long time ago when I imagine the thing that's, that was in Coates' mind was the President of the United States urging people to ingest disinfectants uh, as a possible cure for, uh, for COVID-19. Uh, that was certainly written before uh, there, were, there were taped excerpts that came out of the President saying that he knew perfectly well how deadly this disease was in early February that he'd been briefed on it in January, and that he intended to lie about it to, to, to the people. Just to not, not, not prepare for it in secret, but lie as a means of keeping people's spirits up, but lie just in general, just, just lie about the whole thing. <sighs> I'm sure that will be in the next Vanity Fair. Uh, but this next, the next thing that I want to read you is also by ta Coates. He does a, uh, a profile of Brianna Taylor, fittingly enough, uh, for the cover. And there's one point here. Uh, uh, oh no, it's not his pro. His profile is really good. And there we have there we have the four, the four freshman congresswomen that are uh, that have been making the right wing so agitated. And the the magnificent bald person there is Ayanna Presley, my own representative, who is going to be president one day. I guarantee you. Probably vice president to AOC first, but president on her own. Yes, absolutely. That's going to happen. Probably our first woman, uh, black woman president uh but no there's another piece in here it's not uh it's not uh now i want to be able to find it see uh i marked these things to make sure that i could find them I, it's got to be the ta-nehisi coast thing uh jasmine ward has a great piece in here about losing her lover uh in the early part of the year to a disease that was obviously COVID 19 i mean that's the, the the gist of the uh of the piece is that long before anybody knew what it was, that's what it was. Uh, anyway, here, here we go. I found the, uh, the part. This is a uh, narrative. I just want to read you uh, one long paragraph because it's just heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking. It's, it's from the viewpoint of Brianna Taylor's mother. Uh, so I go back to the apartment and I'm able to get through the street a little more. The street is crowded with police. She has come to, to Brianna's home and the street is filled with police. Uh, and when I get up to the apartment, it's still taped off and roped up around. So I tell the officer there I need to get to the apartment, that something is going on with my daughter. He tells me to hang tight. He tells me to hang tight. He'll get a detective over there to talk to me. 
It takes a little while for him to come. He introduces himself. I don't remember what his name actually is, but he kind of just goes on to ask me if I knew anybody who would want to hurt Briona or Kenny, or if I thought they were involved in anything. And I said, absolutely not. Both of them have jobs. They go to work. They hang out with each other. That's about it. I ask where Kenny is, and the detective tells me, hold on, I'll be back. But it's about another hour or so before he comes back. He asked me if Brianna and Kenny had been having any problems or anything. I say, absolutely not. Kenny would never do anything to Brianna. And then I say, where's Kenny? I need to talk to Kenny. He says, well, Kenny's at one of our offices. He's trying to help us piece together what happened here tonight. We are out there for a number of hours afterwards. It's kind of chilly. I leave. I get coffee and come back. I'm still standing out there waiting. It's about 11 in the morning when the officer comes over and says they are, that they are about done and they are wrapping up and we will be able to get in there once they are finished. I say, where's Briona? Why won't anybody say where Briona is? He says, well, ma'am, she's still in the apartment. And I know what that means. <laughs> Just incredible. Just incredible. Uh, so this issue of Vanity Fair was a pleasant surprise. I was, I loved it. Uh, and then we also have the TLS, the London Times Literary Supplement, uh, which I love dearly. And uh, I was asked, recently I was asked, you know, go through these in fine detail. And I will, I will, but this issue mainly had something else going on in it than, the, than a fine print detail of the, the article. And that was that it was constantly showing me books that I want, <laughs> that I don't have. Like, for instance, uh... Penguin Modern Classics is going to do Leslie Marmon Silko's novel, Ceremony. I would love a copy of that. Probably won't ever be that way in America. Probably not. Uh, probably uh, Penguin Modern Classics I don't think is published in America. So the, the closest I would get is if the Penguin Black Spine Classics eventually does that here in America. But there was also, uh, in the letters page, there's a letter from Margot Miller of Boston, Massachusetts, who mentions in the course of a letter that she's writing uh, a, a, a book that she has written back in 2017 that I missed completely, uh, called Chateau Higginson, Social Life in Boston's Back Bay from 1870 to 1920. Chateau Higginson. I had no idea that it existed. Now I have to find out how available it is because I really, really want it. Uh, uh, and there were others. The, I, usually that happens a couple of times, but in this case, it went on and on. I kept encountering, like, look at this. Wellington, The Road to Lion's Mound, 1769 to 1815 by Daniel Ress. I don't have that, and I want that. <laughs> and I don't think it's ever going to be printed in America. Very frustrating. And that wasn't the only thing. There, uh, there was, uh, in the politics section, Daniel Johnson reviews Why the Germans Do It Better by John Kampfner. Uh, and I read that book and uh, thought it was very, very interesting. I argued with it a couple of times. But he uh, spends the, the first 70 pages, or the first 70 words of his review or more, just arguing about the title, just saying he doesn't like the title. And that, that was a little bit depressing. An editor should have stopped that. An editor should have cut that way down. <laughs> the title is, is there. It, it's already done. And the book, as he quickly points out, is not the same. It's not as facile as the title. But nevertheless, I, I thought, well, I'm flipping through this because I thought there was one other thing, or a couple of other things that I, yeah, here's one. Uh, Ian McGuire, a novel called The Abstainer. I don't have that. Don't think it's out in America. Very much want it from the review, from the description of it. I very much want it. And wasn't there one other? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, there, there, uh, there were a couple of other things that were of interest. But the, well, the, one of the things the TLS does is... Uh, give you an excerpt from a forthcoming book and the fourth the excerpt here is from uh red pill uh by harry kunzru which is a book i very much want and i haven't seen it yet uh the the extract is really really good it's every bit as good as i've been told this book is but there was one line in it that really got to me because of course i am a professional writer i am a freelance writer and the, the, there's a line in the extract that i want to read you because it's brutal <laughs> if you are a freelance writer you're not going to enjoy this uh i'd been a freelance writer since i was 23 it's a ridiculous thing to do. It's time-consuming and poorly paid. You live on your nerves. Sure, you can lie on your couch if you want, but eventually you will starve. <laughs> it hasn't happened to me yet, but it could, I suppose. There was one other thing in here. It wasn't a forthcoming book, but it was something I found just incredibly remarkable. Yes, here it is. Uh, it's, it, the, it's a review of a book called Early by Sara Di Gregorio, uh, which uh, who the author uh, delivered... A baby by C-section uh, 
three months before her due date, and her baby was one pound, 13 ounces. Uh, and the TLS has an illustration for that. That's amazing on its own, and the book sounds incredible, but the TLS has an illustration that stopped me in my track. The caption for this illustration is, The Feet of Amelia Sonia Taylor, born at 21 weeks and six days in Florida in 2006. Look at that picture. That is amazing. Absolutely amazing. And these babies were saved. These babies lived. At that young an age, they lived. It's all, the book is all about premature births, preemies. Uh, and I had no idea. Uh, you, the, you can learn more from a single picture like that, those tiny little feet, than you can learn from a whole book on the subject. I was just blown away. <laughs> just blown away. Uh, and then we have also a package. A package came in the mail. Uh, only one, but there's, there's bound to be others. Uh, so let's, let's see what this is. Uh, the packing list. Oh, okay. I think we've seen this already. The True Adventures of Gideon Lev uh, by Julie Gray, uh, with the assistance of the uh, of the subject, the Rascal Holocaust Survivor Optimus. I think we, uh, this is my second copy of this. Uh, it's a it's a self published work of assisted memoir of this this guy who lived through the Holocaust. Uh, I think we've talked about it already. It sounded really good. Uh, and then uh, the last thing I think this is already long, but we will. The last thing that I wanted to mention, one of you alerted me that Goodreads has posted. Uh, 40 readers' choice favorites for history and biography on the website. That's going to be enormously influential. All of those books will get ordered. Goodreads is a place where people take direction very well. They take recommendations very seriously. Uh, and these are all from the last five years, the list of 40. I looked at the list. As soon as the person told me about it, I went and found the list on Goodreads and looked at it. I've read every book on the list. I've reviewed quite a few of them. And I wanted to recommend 10 out of those 40 and I will leave them listed down below as the 10 that really stand out from this list. The first one being something I mentioned on this channel before, Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, about, again, fraught race relations in, in America. A, an amazingly eye-opening book. I didn't agree with every word of it, but I thought it was fantastic. And then the next one is David Truer's book, The Heartbreak of Wounded Knee, uh, which is also amazing. I think we saw that on that channel as well. I, I read it and then studied it in order to review it. Uh, then Blood in the Water by Heather Ann Thompson about the Attica riots. I wasn't really sure when I heard advanced word about this book that the Attica riots could withstand a whole reading, a whole book. But this is a terrific historian, a terrific author. Uh, then Hidden Figures by Margot Lee Shetterly about uh, women, black women, who helped with uh, the space race, who were human calculators, human computers, uh, in, the, in the very earliest days of that, of, uh, of, space technology and it was it was a prodigious amount of work that went into assembling this book a huge amount of first-hand primary source research had to do had to happen and it's all brought together wonderfully uh, then we have the library book by Susan Orlean I've praised it on this channel many many times I believe I am blurbed on the paperback uh, it's this uh, story about one library fire one specific library fire, Orlean actually relitigates the case to find out if maybe the wrong person was convicted. But a, a huge chunk of the book is just about the magic of libraries. And boy, oh boy, is she eloquent on that subject. Uh, then Midnight at Chernobyl uh, by Adam Higginbotham. I think this is another one that I reviewed. It's just a, it's a, a you know moment by moment breakdown of what happened at Chernobyl set into a larger context. Uh, one of a spate of such books, probably five or six in the last four years, that, uh, but this one stands out as really, really good. Then uh, David Blight's enormous biography of Frederick Douglass, big doorstop of a thing. Not sure whether or not I'm blurbed on the paperback, or if it is in paperback yet, but I loved it. I thought it was just magnificent. I, just just magnificent. And uh, next was the, is The Witches by Stacey Schiff. This is the author of Cleopatra. And in The Witches, she examines the Salem witch trials, the witch craze that swept through colonial America. And uh, again, when I, when I saw the advanced word of it, I thought, well, a lot has been written on this subject. A lot of great books have been written on this subject. I, I, but I'd already learned my lesson not to underestimate this author because of Cleopatra. I originally dis dismissed the idea of writing another book on Cleopatra, and it was great. So, uh, And The Witches is fantastic, too. And then the next book, also a much-written subject, is Walter Isaacson's biography of Leonardo da Vinci. Turns out it's a very good biography. It has lots and lots of competition from lots and lots of people. Serge Bramley's book is incredible. Um, uh, Charles Nichol did a great book on Leonardo, on, on his inner life. 
and it brought together a whole bunch of uh, historical detective work that that author does so well. But Isaacson's is great anyway. Uh, the perfect one volume introduction to the world and life of Leonardo. And lastly, Say Nothing by Patrick Radden Keith. Uh, uh, just riveting reading experience set during the, uh, the Troubles in Northern Ireland. But uh, really brings, puts, uh, puts some human faces on what it was like. I mean, it has one specific incident that it deals with, but the broader atmosphere of the book really get, puts a human face on what it, that was like to live through. Uh, so there you go. Hideously long video. But that is your Friday Mega Stuff video. A bit of this, a bit of that, and a bit of the other thing. So uh, I'm going to, I'll leave a list of those 10 books. They are outstanding from that Goodreads list. The Goodreads list was largely very strong anyway. Uh, but I will leave a list down below and I will wrap this up before it goes to an hour. <laughs> so I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.